Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest LPL Market Signals podcast. Jeff Bookbinder here, your host for today with my friend and colleague, Lawrence Gillum. Uh, Lawrence, I got to warn you, um, I'm coming to see you tomorrow. I'm heading to Fort Mill, South Carolina for a little research shindig, and I hear we're going to be cooking. You better stay away from anything I cook. That's I, probably yeah. the nicest thing I'll ever do for you is provide you with that warning. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And looking forward to seeing everybody. We're having the entire team come over and come into the Fort Mill offices. We are doing a cooking event. Um, I'm, I'm a better eater than cooker. So we'll see how that, that plays out tomorrow. Well, maybe maybe we'll be able to fire up the grill. Because if you want somebody to just throw a burger on a grill, I'm your guy. Anything more than that, uh, look look elsewhere. So looking forward to seeing you and the team, Lawrence. That'll be fun. So, um, and to see uh, our producer, Neil. So um, let's get into our agenda. Of course, you all could have guessed this before you saw this slide on the screen, right? The UBS Credit Suisse, we got to lead with that. Certainly uh, the big news over the weekend, but as we always do, we'll do a market recap after we talk about this deal. Um, and of course, preview the week. Then we will uh, talk about contagion risk, right? We have several ways we can measure Asian risk. In fact, that was the subject of our weekly market commentary, which you can find on LPL.com. Uh, it's um, Monday, as we are recording this, March 20th, 2023. Uh, and I did see that that commentary was indeed uh, posted just a few hours ago. So, um, oh, and, and of course, we'll preview, the, while we preview the week, we'll preview the Fed. Big. Uh, that's really the only big event of the week, other than just folks keeping an eye on the banks. So UBS Credit Suisse, um, I'll set it up, Lawrence, and then I want to get your thoughts. I mean, clearly the most important thing here is that this shotgun wedding, as a lot of people are calling it, reduces the risk of contagion, right? Um, Credit Suisse was clearly a problem. You combine it with the stronger UBS, the Swiss government provides some backstops to um, contain the risk some loss absorption, I guess you could call it, to contain the risk that Credit Suisse became a bigger problem. Uh, and, um, you know, that's a clear that's a clear positive. What else should investors be, be thinking about here? Other, um, you know, sort of level two takeaways. I think that's the highest kind of level one is contagion is reduced. Yeah, for, for sure. So, I mean, the Issues with Credit Suisse, they've been going on for a few years now, right? So this isn't just an abrupt happening where UBS came in at the last minute. I mean, this is this is long overdue, right? And it does take that risk off the table now. So Credit Suisse has always been in the background. Will they default? Will they, you know, will they uh, uh, go under? And and now that's that's off the table uh, because of, of the UBS. Uh, is it a merger acquisition? How I don't know how we're we're, we're framing it, but uh, the the shotgun wedding that took place it does take that Credit Suisse risk off the table, which is uh, something that um, I think a lot of folks will, will be happy happy about. Yeah, I'm sure books will be written about this one. Uh, these two bitter rivals, right? Over many 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 decades, I think you know Credit Suisse has been around for 150 years or something like that. Uh, now coming together, it's it's really and unfortunately, uh, a lot of folks are going to lose their jobs uh, as a result of this. So, you know, kind of following how they put these pieces together and what the new organization looks like down the road, that'll be interesting to follow. Uh, but for our purposes, for, you know, U.S. investors in general, uh, what they care about is the contagion risk. And so uh, it's down. It's not gone, right? Because those those credit Swiss balance sheet risks are really translating over it. They're being sort of transferred uh, to UBS. So they're not gone. They're contained, they're limited, mitigated, but they're, they're not, um, uh, they're not gone. Um, and I, frankly, uh, no other systemically important financial institutions that get the regulatory scrutiny that Credit Suisse is getting um, is under attack like Credit Suisse was. So I think we can sort of move past that as a source of contagion. Now we have to focus on uh, the regional banks a little bit more. We have to focus, you know, maybe commercial real estate risk uh, is a little bit higher, um, things of that nature. But um, 
you know, the, the big banks are safe. In fact, they're getting stronger as a result of this, uh, the, the big banks uh, in the uh, in the U.S. So I, I think that's where we'll stop there um, on, on that topic. Let's get into, you know, broad market recap here. I think, I mean, actually, we after I priced this chart, we rallied even more into the close today. Um, so um, we're now above the 200-day moving average again, which frankly is... Uh, remarkable given what's happened. In fact, you know, stocks really haven't moved in the last, let's call it 10, 12 days. We're right back where we were before, uh, prior to the Silicon Valley bank failure, right? So we're going to continue to watch 200 day. Hopefully this holds. Uh, but if it doesn't, and we pull back, we'll be, as this um, as this slide indicates, uh, kind of in, in in technical no man's land, I will add though that you know we have higher lows from October, and if you ignore the news and just look at what the market's telling you, it's telling you that it maybe it wants to go higher uh, rather than than lower here. So here are the um, you know returns for last week across the various uh, regions, asset classes, uh, sectors. I think I mean what stands out to me, Lawrence, is the dispersion, right? I mean we had the S and P up one and a half percent again, despite what was going on digesting the news of the bank failures in the U.S. while waiting to see how Credit Suisse would play out. And what does the S&P 500 do? It goes up 1.5%. What does the NASDAQ do? It goes up over 4 That's about as big of a spread as you will ever see between the NASDAQ uh, and the S&P 500. So that jumps out. And then, you know, more dispersion, Lawrence, and then I'll, I'll send it back over to you. Look at the sectors last week. We had... Com services, right? The mega cap tech names uh, did really well. Double digit gains in Microsoft, double digit gains in um, Alphabet slash Google, right? And uh, Alphabet Google is in the communication services sector, up 7%. Tech up almost 6%. But look at energy and financials, right? We all know that, that financials have been weak. That makes sense. We had a more than 20% drop in the regional bank group last week. But I think that 7% drop in energy surprises people. You know, oil was down double digits. Um, and uh, that is certainly a concerning signal of economic growth. It's a, it's a positive signal regarding inflation, but a negative signal about economic growth and maybe the reopening in, in China. Um, so um, that's a lot. But any thoughts on any of that, Lawrence, or anything else you want to flag on this on this page? Well, I mean, to your point, the, the dispersion has been pretty remarkable, and, and positioning matters. Uh, and and if you, you know, pick correctly, you're having a, a a great week, great month. But if you've, you know, not necessarily picked the, the right sectors, then it could be a lot worse than what the index level returns are are showing. So maybe sometimes it's better to just take a a holistic S and P five hundred type approach, and and you know. Just accept what the, the index gets you and, and, and not try to pick winners and losers. But um, yeah, it's, it's been quite a remarkable story uh, between the haves and the have not uh, recently. Yeah, this is really when active managers can shine, right? If they avoid the landmines, uh, they can generate uh, some outperformance by being in the areas of the market that are particularly strong. You know, for much of the last decade, kind of everything moved together and there weren't as many opportunities to add value. Uh, by looking different than the index. Uh, the, the only other uh, point I'll mention here um, on this table is, you know, international struggle last week kind of, you know, supports our preference for the U.S. still. When mega cap tech leads, it's very difficult for international markets to keep up. Uh, plus, you have the strong dollar and a flight to safety kind of environment. So here's the uh, the table that Lawrence likes best. This is the, um, the, the fixed income page. So, um, you know, we've got a rally in bonds. Um, we have a chart of rate volatility coming up a little bit later. Uh, but, um, you know, bonds are really, uh, you know, adding some value here uh, recently, Lawrence, um, as we've, you know, taken some rate hikes out of the market. And, uh, you know, markets were worried about um, contagion related to the banks. Yeah, for sure. So fixed income has had a good week, month, year this year so far. Uh, but really talk about the haves and the haves not. We, we've seen a, a a 
maybe a bifurcated response between the, the interest rate markets, the treasury markets, the mortgage backed securities markets, et cetera, and then the, the riskier high yield bond market. Uh, for the longest time, the high yield bond market has kind of been maybe ignoring all the risks associated with all these these rate hikes and, and the potential of a slowing economy. We Over the last two weeks, we did see the high yield bond market kind of wake up uh, and spreads move higher, not to levels where we think that they're attractive again, but we have started to see the high yield market move move higher uh, and, and really start to pay attention to th those additional risks out there, which has kind of been our, our view and our expectations uh, since we made the, the recommendation to to move out of high yield bonds a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, we shored up the quality of our bond portfolios uh, internally, and, and certainly uh, that, that looks like uh, it was a smart move there a few weeks ago. Uh, to turn into commodities, I mean, gold has been on a nice run, you know, contained within this precious metals index. So that actually looks like an interesting opportunity to us, uh, technically and fundamentally. You know, the um, once we kind of get through this um, uh, this period of stress, uh, we think the dollar will move lower, and that's that's bullish for 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 gold. And then, um, you know, lower gold likes lower interest rates too, and so we think we're probably an environment where interest rates at least stay where they are, if not um, uh, even move potentially a little bit lower. So uh, so gold is an interesting investment to consider here. Uh, and then I mentioned the energy sector was bad last week. The energy index, you know, oil and natural gas uh, down uh, last week quite a bit. In fact, actually, I think natural gas is now down 90% from its highs in Europe. It certainly helped Europe uh, withstand the impact of the um, Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, but at some point, natural gas needs to stabilize to help the energy sector turn around. Uh, we have a we still have a positive view of energy, but that is getting to be uh, a more painful uh, position each day. So we're watching that one closely. Um, we would we would say energy sector investments on watch uh, based on the uh, the technical deterioration there. So let let's um. Well, we are still talking about the broad market. I uh, wanted to show this chart from our chief technician, Adam Turnquist. This is a really um, powerful story here. Um, this is a December lows indicator that shows that when the S&P 500 holds its December lows in the first quarter, uh, the years tend to be much better. This is going back to 1950. And you see uh, the orange line, which ends up being a gain of about 18%. If the December lows hold in Q1, that's the average year, up 18%. If the December lows don't hold in Q1, and by the way, we're about 3% above the December lows right now, maybe, maybe a little more than 3% after uh, this rally into the close today. If you break the December lows in Q1, uh, you end up on average with a flattish year. That's this dark blue line uh, at the uh, at the bottom, and then the gray line in the middle is just your average, you know, high single digit kind of year. So, um, you know, not only are you, you know, more more likely to see better returns, um, the batting average is like ninety four percent. So, we're really rooting for, for those to several those to hold for just the next you know, six, seven sessions here. It's March 20th. We're almost there. These things don't always hold, right? They're exceptions. It's a, it's not 100%. Uh, it's, it's you know, in the 90s. But boy, that'll be a real strong feather in the bull's cap um, if, if that holds. So let's get into contagion. And this is where I'm really glad I have a fixed income expert on with me, Lawrence, because we're getting into some fixed income-y kind of things uh, when we talk about contagion risk. So the weekly market commentary, we basically had four measures of contagion. Um, so the four of them are, you know, European Bank CDS, uh, the VIX, the TRIN, T-R-I-N, which I'll explain in a minute, and then the MOVE index, uh, interest rate volatility measure. So um, let's start with European Bank uh, CDS. And uh, Lawrence, you can explain what a CDS is um, and, and then just talk about what you see when you look at this chart. Yeah, so a CDS is really just an insurance uh, policy in, in effect. Uh, the, the price is against default. So if, if a, a company is about to go to default, 
a company is about to default, their CDS prices would go higher because it would cost more to insure against a, a default. So what we're showing here are the European bank credit default swap rates. Uh, and as you can see, the last week or so, we did see rates spike higher. So the, the cost to insure against default has increased, but not to the levels where we would we would think that these are, are flashing any types of warning signs, right? So we're still at levels that are lower than what we saw back in September, October, November of, of last year, uh, you know, when frankly no one was talking about contagion. Uh, so we don't think that uh, just because that that word has come up more in conversations these days, that doesn't mean that it's actually true that the contagion risks uh, have increased. If you look at this chart and all the other charts that we're going to look at today, we would we would argue that the contagion risks are still pretty low. This is amazing to me that, you know, at the October 2022 lows in the S&P 500, default risk for European banks was higher in the market's eyes than it is now. <laughs> now, today, this, this chart was priced last Thursday. So today, you know, the risk has gone up a bit as the market transfers the credit, dis uh, credit Swiss default risk over to UBS default risk. So you know, we're, we're, we're a little bit more contained broadly, maybe, <laughs> but the risk in UBS, the market is saying is higher. Um, so, you know, this, we're not in the clear, but still, this really suggests that, um, uh, th that the risk of contagion is, is low. So we don't think, I mean, this is just the first piece of evidence, but we don't think this is a full-blown banking crisis. There'll be some other little stumbles. We still have to wait for uh, a plan maybe to contain um, First Republic, which is, um, you know, which was down 70% last week. I think it was down another 40% today. Uh, so there's still more, um, you know, let's call them unsettled situations that the market needs to wait uh, for regulators or the banking industry to address. But yeah, this, and I think that's, the, really that's the important point that you make to, right, right there, Jeff, is that there are going to be some idiosyncratic, more individual issues with some banks. But just by looking at this uh, index right here, broadly, the the health of the European financial system still looks like it's in pretty good shape. But there will be some episodes where individual banks come under stress. Yeah, absolutely. I tell you, it's if, if it's a competition for mismanagement of banks, though, we might already have seen our winners. Um, <laughs> I'll say it that way. Um, so uh, next is the VIX, right? The fear gauge, a lot of people call it, or the fear index. Uh, this is just a measure of the implied volatility from the options market in the stock market, right? So what is the option market saying about how volatile stocks will be? And um, this is this looks like a pretty calm reading. We're um, around 25 right now. This chart actually was priced when we were a little higher, like 26 and a half. That is about a 40th percentile reading. So really not, not high at all. And you compare it here again, uh, the VIX now is lower than it was in October of last year, right when the S&P bottomed. And it doesn't even register as a blip, a blip compared to the pandemic, <laughs> right? Or if you took this back further, the financial crisis in you know 2008 2009 so the stock market is is saying it could be wrong but the stock market is saying that the crisis is contained and there's really not a whole lot to uh to worry about here so um let's go to the trend you know i actually i mean i see this index cited lawrence but i don't really have much of a um of a background in it so i'm relying on george smith from our team who put this chart together and uh, you know, made these observations. It's it's a measure of the velocity of selling. So it's not just our stocks going down. It's how much selling is happening as stocks are going down. And so you see here, um, you know, over ten is pan or over two rather is panic selling. And on March 9th, we got panic selling. That was you know right before Silicon Valley Bank failed. But if you look to the right of this chart. We're back below average. Neutral is one. We're we've been below average, kind of late last week, and certainly we were below average today. I mean, the market was up almost one percent today. So this is a really encouraging sign too, right? the The amount of fear based on the trend index 
is suggesting that this is kind of a normal average average market. What do you think, Lawrence? You buying it? I mean, it's, it's yeah. If, I mean, if you look at the price action for those couple of days where things looked like there may have been a, a broader sell off or a broader spillovers into other industries or sectors, but uh, which was on you know March 9th. But since then, things have calmed down. We've seen that in other financial indicators as well. So I'm I'm buying it. I believe it. Yeah, me too. I mean, we're putting enough indicators together to create a a big picture and they're um they're all pretty consistent so um the last one we have is is all you lawrence the move index it's basically the volatility of rates it is so this is uh similar to to the vix uh index that we just talked about this is the implied volatility for interest rates we have seen this index move higher right so the interest rate volatility within the, the fixed income markets is at the highest levels uh frankly since the gfc uh, higher levels than what we experienced back in uh, the, the COVID-19 shutdowns too. So if you're looking for things that maybe seems out of sorts, this is it. And and we know that. I mean, for those of us that follow the markets every day, we see all the volatility in the rates market. You know, there's been seven sessions of of uh, the, the two-year treasury yield plus or minus 20 basis points in a day. You just, you don't, ex you don't expect that kind of stuff coming out of the U.S. treasury market. Uh, this index here confirms that we are in unusual times uh, as it relates to interest rate volatility. What's it mean? I mean, it means that the the, the Fed is engineering an aggressive rate hiking campaign, uh, and there may be more, or there may be less. As, right now, this is this is saying that there's a lot of uncertainty with the path forward with interest rates, uh, and, and that's kind of what that spike there represents. Uh, it doesn't speak to any sort of contagion or spillover impact from the the banking crisis. It really speaks to the 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 uh, I guess the difficult job that the Fed has ahead of it, um, ahead of their meeting this week, for sure. Yeah, it's one of the more interesting Fed meetings I can remember uh, leading into it. I guess, I mean, when you when you hike rates over four percentage points in less than a year, and then you, you know, throw the whole market on its head with this banking stress and take a bunch of rate hikes out <laughs> of the Fed funds market all in a very short period of time. I mean, it's no wonder we're seeing this uh, such a high rate volatility. Plus, we're in a very high inflation environment, as we all know, which, you know, rates have to respond to maybe differently uh, than they did a few years ago. So, there, you know, there's some unique factors here going on. But I, I can tell you that I've paid more attention to rates now, you know, in the last probably um, a few months than I than I ever have in my entire life. <laughs> so, um, and that'll continue through the Fed meeting, uh, no doubt. So, yeah, buckle your seatbelts. Um, we're um, we're seeing interest rate volatility, and that that maybe underscores just how volatile or how unique this environment is, and how confusing it is. Right? People just really uh, have different views of the market, and uh, we keep getting different information, um, you know, every day that can can move people's views around. So that's that. Let's talk uh, Fed. Here's another reason why I'm glad you're with me, Lawrence, because you know the Fed um, as well as anybody on our team. Uh, I mean, we alluded to it a little bit, right? Uh, the Fed, the, the market has taken out several rate hikes, right, as a result of uh, the banking crisis. So the question people are asking, I mean, I'm not sure how much 25 basis points means in the grand scheme of things. But the question everybody's asking is, are they going to go 25 or are they going to pause? And I can make a strong case for either, but I think what's probably more, more important is what's been taken out of the Fed funds market for you know the last for, for the next several meetings, right? And how much the terminal rates come down. Yeah, it seems like it was only a couple of weeks ago, and it, and it was when market uh, markets were pricing in a, a terminal rate above five fifty, maybe, and we had some. Uh, people out there talking about a six percent Fed uh, terminal Fed funds rate, or even six and a half, seven percent. All that is out the window, according to market pricing. Markets are saying maybe there's one more rate hike, maybe this meeting, maybe May. Uh, but then over the course of this year, starting in June, it looks like markets are pricing in rate cuts, uh, which seems to be I don't know. I I don't really fully believe. The, the market pricing, I think maybe they've gone, the market's gone a little bit too far too fast. Uh, but I think what is is interesting is that, um, yeah, just the, the, the 
rapid repricing that we've seen over the over the last two weeks. Over 150 basis points of rate hikes have been taken out of the market, which is I I can't remember the the market moving that quickly uh, when we're talking about you know expected rate hikes turning into rate cuts. Unbelievable. Yeah. So if you look out to the end of the year, you know, you're talking about going from like 540 to 390, you know, in just a few weeks. It's really uh, unbelievable. These are just the three uh, Fed funds curves, February 16th, March 9th, March 15th. And that arrow just shows you how the terminal rate has come down from, yeah, about 5.5 to a little over 4.5, um, close to 4.7, probably close to 4.70. So um, just a historic uh, move, uh, no doubt. And um, yeah, I agree with you, Lawrence, um, even though I'm kind of an amateur Fed watcher, not a pro, but I think the market has gotten a little too aggressive pricing in these cuts. And after the um, the ripples from the banking stress calm, uh, we'll likely see the, you know, these curves uh, move higher. So yeah, I, I think if the Fed is looking at the same sort of financial indicators that we're looking at, and, and they do, I think they'll see that maybe the the, the chances of contagion, the can uh, the chances of that spillover risk, maybe aren't as great as uh, one would expect. So, you know, our and, and to your point earlier, I think it's it, it's exactly right. We can make a, a cogent argument for a pause or for a twenty five basis point hike at this next meeting, given kind of all the all the you know the the, the events that have happened over the past two weeks. Our view is that the Fed's going to hike rates by twenty five basis points uh, at this meeting. Um, but again, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they said we're going to take it slower and, and raise rates by 25 next next meeting. So we'll have to see how this one plays out. I'm from Kansas City, so anytime I can bring up the Kansas City Fed, I have to take advantage of it. So Tom Honing, the former chair uh, of Kansas City Fed or president of the Kansas City Fed, uh, said that the Fed hasn't decided this yet. <laughs> right. So they're going to let like right up until the last minute and look at what's going on with the banks before they decide what to do. So, and I actually, I think I buy that. I think I buy that. It's really, um, it, it, it's a close, uh, it, it's, it's a close call. The only so, thing I would uh, add too is that the, the ECB raised rates by 50 basis points last week during all of this tumult. So I think uh, there is, there is a history, there is precedent of, of a central bank hiking during kind of financial stresses like this, especially if they think that these financial stresses are are behind us. So um, it would be interesting if if the ECB hiked rates uh, by 50 basis points last week and then the Fed does nothing. I think that would be a, an, an interesting dichotomy because normally the ECB is extremely dovish versus a, a Fed that's a little bit more aggressive. So um Again, a, a lot of moving pieces for this week's meeting. Yeah, that that's you hit on the reason why I'll still uh, bet on the on the hike rather than the pause. And of course, if they pause, people will wonder, you know, what do they know that the market doesn't? And you know that that could spook markets. So, and they they probably would rather not deal with that. So uh, you know, meeting. I guess the decision is Wednesday, or the announcement is Wednesday, but meeting starts uh, Tuesday. We'll be watching that closely. Um, just to, to, we'll wrap up on that, Lawrence, because I don't think there's anything else on the economic calendar that anyone cares about. <laughs> and I said it right here. Few will pay much, if any, attention to this week's economic data calendar. In fact, people didn't really care about retail sales or the CPI all that much last week because we were watching banks uh, so closely. Well, same story this week, right? I don't think any... I mean, you could challenge me on that if you see a data point here that you really think the market's going to care about. But frankly, uh, I think it's all about all about the Fed and then, you know, watching bank headlines. Yeah, for sure. I I, I agree with you. This meeting, it also comes with a, an updated summary of economic projections. So we're not only going to get uh, potentially another 25 basis point rate hike, but we'll also get the Fed's expectations on inflation, growth, where the dot plot is going to settle out over the over the next few years, which may be interesting to see how or if those those expectations have changed. Uh, I would have to imagine they would. So we'll have to see how that uh, how that looks on on Wednesday as well. But uh, no, to your point, there's really nothing else on the calendar this week uh, that's going to trump the uh, the FOMC rate decision on on Wednesday. Absolutely. So uh, I guess I'll end with another uh 
promo for the weekly market commentary, please take a look at that on LPL.com. Uh, uh, we actually put some investment ideas in there uh, at the end for this environment. So uh, that I think should be uh, of interest to uh, to many of you. Thank you, Lawrence, for joining. Uh, thank you, all of you, for uh, tuning in to another LPL Market Signals podcast. Uh, Lawrence, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow in Fort Mill. Hopefully, uh, the flight is on time. Yeah, safe travels for sure. <laughs> we shall see. And again, reminder, don't eat anything I cook. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.